Today is November 21st, 2017. Welcome to Ms. Hale's fourth hour social studies class of Rincon Vista School. We are working on the Growing Up in Vale Oral History Project. For the report, I would like to ask you to tell us your name and when you were born. Don Styler, September 29, 1949. Well, I'm really, really pleased today um, that Mr. Don Styler was able to, uh, you know, work it into his schedule to come and share. Uh, he just has lots of great stories about growing up in Vail, about going to school. He moved here in 1954. So he has lived in Vail longer than I've been alive. That's <laughs> pretty neat. He's seen a lot of changes. Um, be sure and ask him, and he might just tell you uh, when he tells his first story how many students um, were in Vail, uh, who the teachers were. He's got a great story about learning to drive a truck, um, you know, working for the school district, um, special programs, asking about holiday programs and if you ever had a, a park, what they were like. You know, some of the questions that you've been asking others, but uh, anyway, I'm, I'm going to stop talking now. Right. The other thing is that when he grew up, he worked for the railroad, and so you might ask him about what that was like, too. All right. When my parents moved, moved here in, in 1954, there was no Interstate 10. Uh, and the road that you everybody used was Highway 80. And the frontage road that's in front of the Vail Steakhouse and the, the Vail administration, that was the highway. That was the two-lane road, 60 miles an hour speed limit. And at the top of the hill from where the Vail School Administration is, if you look down, the, the road goes straight and then it curves where the interchange is for the Highway 83. If you look down on the north side of the road, there's a, there's a slab right there. Mr. Steiner, I think I'm going to have you use the mic. All right. Do you mind? No, I don't. Okay. You should put that around your neck. There was there was a, there's a slab there. That was my living room, and that's where I, I lived. We we lived behind the we had the gas station and the cafe, and uh, and it was our living quarters were built into it. We, uh, we were there till about I'd say 59 or 60, and then they put the highway through and tore it down. And my dad had been building a house back behind it, and then we lived in, we lived in that house, and, and that's where I, I stayed until uh, I graduated. And they, I went to Tucson High School. They uh, obviously Vail didn't have a high school. They bust us into Tucson High, and there were three of us in the eighth grade. And they put there was a boy. I'll, I'll, I can talk about him later if you want. But he was he was 16 years old, and he was in the seventh grade. And he went to Vail until he was in the third grade. And then he, his parents moved to Tucson, and because he couldn't speak any English at all when he came to Vail School, they had to teach him how to speak English before they could teach him anything. And it was his reading level that caused him to have a problem. And he got left back three three times in Tucson. And then, then his parents moved back out to Vail again. And, and uh, they were afraid, that the teachers were afraid that he would not, that he would quit school because he was the oldest of eight kids. And he had a job. He was going to Vail school and he had a job. And they, they let him graduate. They, they put him up a year. He was in the seventh grade and he graduated with us. And he, he graduated from Tucson High School. So that was pretty nice. But uh, when I started in the first grade in 55, there were 36 students in eight grades, three teachers. And the, and the Trotter sisters, there's a road named after them over there by the, by the Quick Mart, and that, that's not enough. I don't know why they don't have, have schools named after them. They should. These two sisters, and they actually had a farm in South Carolina. They would go home every summer. But they taught school here for like, I don't know, well, how many years? 30, 30 40 years? Yeah. And uh, I mean, their 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 life was was the school. They, you know, they didn't they didn't have any children or anything. And, and having the, those two teachers, it was like it was like having your aunt, your favorite aunt, be your teacher. I mean, they, and they treated you. Know, and going to school back then, with none of almost everybody, I was an exception. I got to see other kids because my parents had their restaurant, and, and kids would come in there with the parents. Most of the kids didn't have anybody to play with at all. And they didn't even see anybody. And going, so going to school, you know, everybody wanted to go to school. Not like it is today. Every, nobody wanted to miss school. And uh, and the, the uh, we had a Dick and Jane book in the first grade. 
and it was big. It was as big as the top of one of your desks. And I don't know how many, the first and second graders were in the same class. But at the end of the, and, and now we're talking no Sesame Street, no kindergarten. And I don't think anybody's parents ta taught them anything. But the first day of school, everybody went home with their Dick and Jane book and read the first two pages in that book to their parents, the first day of school. And, and as far as the Christmas programs were concerned, I realized all these schools here now are way too big to do what they used to do. But uh, we'd always have some kind of a play, like the Three Kings or, or the, the, the Mexican Christmas. But uh, at Christmas time, always had Santa Claus and always had a big Christmas tree. And all, all the kids would be in, in whatever play we had. You know? and, as, and as I got older, I mean, I don't think it was because I was good, it was because they didn't have a lot of numbers, but I always ended up being one of the main people in whatever it was. But uh, I have a picture of you. Do you care if I show it? No, I don't care. That was yeah, me as a one of the three kings. I remember I came home from school one day and my mother asked me, you know, what, what, was, what was going on for Christmas? And I said, well, I'm going to be in this play. <laughs> and she says, oh, you are? And I, and I said, and I, would, I didn't even think about it at the time because I was just a little kid, you know, I told her. I said, well, you know, you're going to have to make my costume. <laughs> and I think she was a little apprehensive, but she, she did all right. I think that this was a, was a tablecloth, I think. But... Uh, uh, it, it was it was fun, and and you knew. Even when I when I graduated, there were 99 students from the eighth grade, and they had four teachers then. But I I'm I'm sure that I knew every every student and from the first grade to the eighth grade. I knew every student, and we used to have Easter egg hunts at, at uh, for Easter, and the older kids would hide the eggs for the little kids, and then we then we'd help them find them too. And, uh, it was quite an experience. I mean, I, I and I didn't realize how lucky I was until after I went into town, went to Tucson High, and talked to kids about the schools they went to. You know, it wasn't anything like like what I did. And, and uh, a lot of times too, when I was say in the fourth, fifth, sixth grade, the two sisters had a lot of flowers. They had a little house on the school grounds, and they planted a lot. They had a lot of plants, a lot of flowers. And I mean, they, they they would have bushel baskets, big baskets full of flowers that they would pick. And the, the teacher that taught the first and second grade, her name was Lottie. We called them both there, Esther and Lottie. We called them Miss Lottie or Miss Esther. That's what we called them. Lottie. She would take four or five of the of the first grade boys to the house in the afternoon, and they would do gardening. And and I did it. You know, no, nobody minded. It was just something you did. And and they would always pick one of the older students to come in and teach the class uh, while she was gone. I used to do that a lot too, as I as I got older. And uh, let me get back to Christmas. The Christmas programs. The school would give everybody a. Uh, they had bags of like fruit and candy and nuts, and then, and then everybody would get one of those. And then they had two, they actually had four presents. They had two for girls and two for boys, and one for the younger kids and one, and one for the older kids. Everybody got the same thing. And if you wanted to give somebody, you know, your girlfriend a present or something, there, you could do that. You, you could wrap it up, put it in the tree, and Santa Claus would give it to her. That was the, and, and, and we would sing songs and all the, all the old songs they like Silent Night and that note that kind of stuff we would sing. I uh, I don't want to let you guys ask me questions because I can ramble on for the whole time here, but I don't know what you guys are really interested in, interested in. So why don't you just go ahead? What was your favorite subject in school and why? Uh, I think I like math. But, and I don't, I don't really know why it just came easy to me. And, and uh, but all the stuff, all the classes that they that they taught, and the way they taught them, were, it, it was interesting for, for for everybody. I didn't particularly care for English that much because I didn't like to write papers. But uh, anybody else? Yes. Does every person in your family attend school? Does that make sense? You mean my, in my family? I, I, I had a brother that was 12 years older than me, and he went to Tucson High, 
for uh, for one year when we moved out here, and then he went to Marine Corps. So uh, I didn't have any other you know, kids kids around. So yes. Did you have any pets growing up? Lots of dogs. I had a boro for a while, but he. I don't know why my parents got me a boro instead of a horse. <laughs> he wasn't. He he was. I tried to ride him once, and, and I remember I got on him and I rode him out in the desert. You know, we probably got at least a mile away from my house, and he stopped. And, and there was nothing I could do to make him move. And that was the last time I tried to ride him. So just mainly dogs. We had a couple of cats, but you know, cats don't survive or really get out here. What kind of food did your family usually eat when you were young? And how did you get your food? Well, my mother cooked, yeah, and, and we were a real, uh, I had I had red meat and potatoes and a green vegetable every day of my life. I mean, that's what we ate, you know, meatloaf or pork chops, or, you know, beef stew or and no, no Mexican food. And we, you know, we were from New York and my dad, my dad didn't like spicy food, so. And he thought anything Mexican had to be spicy. So. <laughs> and also, what was your favorite meal? My favorite meal? Yes. Uh, you know, I've always liked pretty much everything. I think I like meatloaf. You know, my, my mother used to make chicken and dumplings, too. That was pretty good. Yes? Um, what transportation did your family use to get around? We don't use the, we had a pickup truck. You know, and my parents would uh, go to town at least one day a week. Go used to go grocery shopping. And when I was uh, up until about the fifth grade, my parents would usually leave about ten o'clock in the morning, and uh, they didn't want me to come home from school and have it not be anybody there. So they would come to the school and take me to town. With them. And uh, I remember uh, one day uh, after that my mother had done this probably a half a dozen times and she i remember her talking to miss esther and she said I'm, I'm i'm sorry that i take him out of school as often as i do but we don't want him to come home and, and have us not be there and i remember she told my mother she said he's going to learn more going to tucson with you than he's going to learn here and, and and he told me that uh, uh, she told me when, when i was probably in like maybe the fourth grade she said, uh, read all the signs that you see. And if you don't if you see a word you don't know, ask your mother. And, and I would do that. You know, but, I, but I was, I like school. And I got good grades and I like school. Yes. What would you do for fun? For fun? Well, when I was really little and we still had the, the cafe, they were building, you know, they were building Interstate 10. And all the, all the construction people used to come in in the morning. they come in the morning and eat and eat breakfast. And then they'd stop on their way home and drink beer. <laughs> and I, obviously I was a little kid and, and I would, you know, all the customers, the regular customers, they all knew me. And I, I, I was building a road. My dad was we were, was building the house and he, he had a, a ditch that, that I think my bro, older brother dug it. It was quite, it was probably 150 feet at least. And I had a big mound of dirt on the side of the wall. And I, I was building a road. I had a grader pretty good sized grader, it was probably three feet long, I could sit on it. And I would use coffee grounds, because obviously my, we had a lot of coffee grounds. I would use coffee grounds for the asphalt. <laughs> and that's what I did when I was little. And then as I, as I got older, uh, I've been a ham radio operator since, since uh, you know, I was probably 12, 13 years old. And I got into radios, and then, and then once I got into radios, that was pretty much all I did. When, you know, I mean, I. I had a basketball backboard and I'd go out and shoot baskets once in a while, but you know, it really wasn't any fun by myself. So I would, you know, pretty much just play with my radio stuff. And if you see my house now, you can tell I've got six towers in my yard, so and lots of radio stuff. Good hobby. Go ahead. So what was the cool thing that like um, um, as kids everybody wanted? Like everybody what? wanted? Yeah. What was the trend? Probably a television. And my father, when we and back in New York, our next door neighbor was a TV repairman. And, and my dad, by the time we moved to Arizona, he was on his third television. And when we got out to Vail, uh, there there were no, I don't know how familiar you guys are with watching television that isn't on cable or isn't on satellite, but uh, the, the TV stations, there were two, and they were in Tucson. And uh, the, old, the old TVs didn't work that good. 
and but we were able to watch TV. But we, we had an ant we had two te two antennas connected together, pointed at Tucson, and then Channel Nine was the first one to go on Mount Lemmon, and, uh, and we could get there really good. But it, but when I think back, there were probably less than ten televisions, and when I say less than ten, I don't mean nine. I mean like four or five. The only people that had televisions were the were the big ranches, and there were four or five big ranches around. And uh, and another thing, electricity wise, if you if you didn't have a generator, you didn't have electricity because there was we didn't have uh, Tucson Electric until probably no when I was eighth or ninth grade, we had a generator before that. And. Uh, my, uh, the generator that we had, I mean, there was a generator obviously at the place when we bought it, but it was only big enough. We had a beer cooler that ran off of it. It was like a big refrigerator. And, uh, and then we had gas pumps. And, and I could, I would, if I was watching television and somebody came to get gas, my dad would yell at me and I'd have to turn the TV off because the generator would not run the beer cooler, the gas pump, and the television at the same time. So, I mean, you, you, a lot of the things you guys take for granted that uh, other people we didn't have. And I was just fortunate that my dad was a little bit of a technology guy or else we wouldn't have had a TV either. Okay. Go, go ahead. What were some traditions your family had when you were younger? Well, we pretty much just, you know, Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas dinner and, you know, and just the regular stuff. There wasn't anything, anything out of the ordinary, you know. And then when we had the restaurant, obviously, uh, I mean, I would eat my, I would eat breakfast and with, with the customers. At least my favorite was ham and eggs without the ham, <laughs> <laughs> and the hamburgers, and you know, and, uh, and but uh, like I said, I was pretty lucky. I got to, uh, you know, I think my vocabulary and my. Uh, uh, Ability to uh, carry on a conversation with adults was greatly increased by uh, by being at the at the cafe. And I was so little that I want to guess that the counter was probably about this high, and there was a shelf underneath. And if I stood on the floor, I couldn't see I couldn't see anybody. And I would I would get scoot I would get up in there and hold on. There was a piece of wood underneath the inside edge, and I would sit there and hold on to the inside of the counter and talk to people. I, and I, let me tell you one of my favorite stories. I was about, I don't think I was in school yet. I was probably like five years old. And, and there was a, a cowboy from from Sonoida that he was an old man and he had false teeth. Of course, I didn't know what false teeth were. And my mother never made me, we had candy bars and we had, we had soda. And my mother was pretty smart. She never told me, you, know, you can't have that or don't eat another one. She never did that. So when I got over the initial of having all these candy bars there, it wasn't a big deal. And I would eat maybe one candy bar a day, maybe two. And this, this cowboy had been in Tucson. He delivered some cattle. And, uh, and he was stopped on his way home to get something to eat. And he and I were by ourselves down at the end of the counter. So we're talking, and, and uh, my mother kept the, the boxes of candy under the counter, and we had a little like a display thing in the back. And I was talking to him, and I, and I was filling the rack of candy bars. And when I got done, I, I think it was a Three Musketeers. I took it, and I opened it up, and I took a bite out of it. He looks at me, and I, I don't know how he kept a straight face, but he, he said, you know, I used to eat a lot of candy. So, you know, you know so, you know, and he, he took, he had a complete upper and lower set of false teeth. And he took his false teeth out of his mouth and put them on the counter. He says, that's what happens when you eat too much candy. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I never said a word to my parents, but I bet you I didn't eat a candy bar for two years. <laughs> and I bet he laughed all the way, all the way back to the Sonoida because he knew he got me good. <laughs> Go ahead. I have to ask, who was the ranger? Well, he worked for H.B. Thurber, but it was one of his cowboys. I don't remember who it was. <laughs> Yes. Um, what what type of music was popular, and what kind of dance moves were also popular? Well, you know, I don't. There was only one radio station that everybody listened to, really, and, and there was no FM. Play. And 
KTKT it was 990 back then. And I think it's still around, but I think it's an Hispanic station now. But they played the popular music like like KRT plays now. And uh, when we got old enough to to want to listen to music, I mean, most of us had other, other stuff. It wasn't in, it wasn't important to like everybody like it is now. You know, I don't think music really became something to do until like maybe high school, because at, at Dale it was just you know there was just other stuff to do. I mean, and a lot of the and we're only talking you know 50, 60 kids total, and uh, probably half of them lived on a ranch. And uh, if you lived on a ranch, whether your whether your parents owned it or whether they worked there, I mean you had stuff to do. And and listening to the radio wasn't one of those things. <laughs> Uh, what were some of the ranches? The names of some of the ranches? Well, the Andrada Ranch, uh, and uh, there was, there's a, if you, anybody, the Andrada Ranch is on the old Sonoda Highway. Okay, there, and I'll tell you a little, little story, but the, there's another ranch this side of it, and uh, when we first moved here, uh, you guys probably won't know any of these people, but if you ever heard of Tom Mix, Tom Mix was a big silent western star, big time. Well, he owned the ranch, and the brand was the, was the TM for Tom Mix. Well, he'd already, he, he had died, he died in the car accident. But when we moved here, there was another, an actor, Audie Murphy. Audie Murphy bought the ranch, and Audie Murphy used to come to my parents' restaurant. And Audie Murphy, uh, he was a short guy, and he, to this day, he was in the Army during World War II, and he won the Medal of Honor. He's the most decorated soldier to this day in the United States Army. No one has had more decorations than him. And he used to come to my parents' place and eat. He didn't look at me. I mean, I didn't know who he was. I, mean, I didn't know he was a big actor. And he didn't, you know, he'd come in with, you know, cow, cow poop on his on his boots and Levi's and a Western hat that looked like a horse had stepped on him. You know? He looked any different than anybody else. But there were those two ranches, and then back on the, there was a La Posa Camada which is where Colossal Cave is. And that was owned by, if you, if you, you may have heard of Sandra Dale Connors, who was a Supreme Court Justice for a long time. Well, she, she's from a ranching family and up in the, I think, is it Globe where she's from? In that area. Well, her brother, Charlie Day, owned the La Costa Camada Ranch for a long time. And, and it was a pretty good sized ranch. I mean, it, it, they ran cattle all the way down where my parents' place was and back up in the mountains. And then there's the X9 Ranch was next was the next one over, and there was a man Henry Jackson that owned that, and uh, he ended up selling it, and, and he was from the Midwest, and, and he was a, a senator, I think. And, and the only reason he moved back was because somebody convinced him he should run for the Senate, and he couldn't be here in Arizona, he had to move back there. And then uh, where the uh, Rocking K Ranch Estates is, that was a ranch. And uh, some doctor owned that place. And then Rancho de Lago was, uh, I think it had been a lot of things. I mean, there, I have a friend, Jimmy Leone, and, and he's, he's probably 80 years old. And he went to Vail School. And his father did a lot of work at, at, at Rancho de Lago. In fact, he helped build the Catholic Church. So if you guys could get him to come here, <laughs> he's got stories before me. And, uh, and, and, uh, the generators, all the all the big ranches had diesel generators, and all and all and uh, everybody else had had ones that ran on gas. And there were two people that maintained those two different businesses. And they used to come on my parents' place all the time. So I you know. Anything else? Yeah. 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 What was your favorite part of high school? High school. Well. I think probably uh, going to Tucson High School was a, it was like a culture shock at first because you know that there were 99 students here and there were there were three of us really in the eighth grade. There were 3,000 students at Tucson High School, and uh, I think I, I liked uh, like I said I always liked school. I liked the classes and. And the kids, T Tucson High back then was a lot different than it is today. Uh, I would have a teacher that was, let's say he was 
in his late fifties, and and there would be six kids in, in the class that he taught their parents and their aunts and their uncles. And Tucson High used to be the only only high school in Tucson, and. We won the state football championship all four years I was there. And we had more than 50% Hispanics and a lot of black kids. And, and obviously there was a lot of white kids. Everybody got along. There was no discrimination. There were no problems. Nobody got in fights or any arguments. It, it, it was, none of that was there. And uh, there was one black cheerleader. And when I was a senior, she was a homecoming queen. I voted for her. I mean, no, there was no, and then somebody, after I graduated about five years, six years later, somebody decided that they needed to uh, uh, diversify the school, and not just Tucson High, everywhere. So they take these kids, the families for generations have been living in one area, and they all go to the same school, and everybody likes it. And then they decide, well, let's, we're going to take all these kids, and we're going to bust them out to Palo Verde, and, and Sabino, and, and we're going to bring those kids downtown. And it ruined the school. But they stopped it. It's, not, it's back to the way it used to be. What but, years were you there? Uh, 60, I graduated in 67. In fact, Friday I'm having my 50th high school reunion. That's great. But two, uh, it was going to, and, and the, another thing, I was on the bus because I was like at the beginning, there, there were two kids that got on the bus before me, two girls, and they lived on the TM ranch and they hated living out there and, and, and they didn't like getting up early in the morning and, and, and they, they always wanted to sleep. But I know I knew these girls for, forever, so I wouldn't let them sleep. You know, I'd hide her ass and try to go to sleep. But it was a, the bus ride was long. Uh, I probably got on the bus about 5.30 in the morning. Now, here's another thing. Vail School right now probably has a hundred buses at least. We had three or four, and when I started, they had two. And for the high school, we had one bus. Well, I think you all have some idea how big the Vail School District is. Well, I lived up there by the Vail School Administration, and we would come down the highway. Out and uh, I'm trying to think how we did this. Anyway, we don't know it. We went back. We went the Colossal Cave Road and went all the way around by the cave and around and we went to Houghton Road and we came up Houghton Road to, uh, to I-10. And I remember there were a whole bunch of roads that, and they're here now that weren't here then. And then, and then we would go, uh, we'd go to Corona de Tucson and then we'd come back out to I-10 and go down to Rita Road. And at Rita Road, there's an El Paso uh, turbine station, a big pumping station that's south of the highway. Well, it's all automated now. Back then, they actually was, they had houses there. there. There, if you worked there, you lived there. There was probably ten houses, and there was always kids to pick up. So we'd go in there and pick up kids, and then we'd come out, and then we'd go down to Wilmot, and uh, Wilmot Road went went north and dead ended about where Valencia is now. But it wasn't Valencia; it, it was Old Vale Road. And when you, if, when you go up Cold Road where, the, where Valencia is, you'll notice there's some houses there on the left. Well, those houses were there, but Cold Road wasn't there, and Valencia wasn't there. There was a dirt road that went by those houses and went to Wilmot, and, and there were kids there. So we'd have to go in there and pick up those kids. And then we'd go back out and then go, and get on the highway and go, go to Tucson High. And then at night, we would reverse it and do it in the opposite direction. So I was on the bus for more like maybe an hour and a half in the morning and another hour and a half at night. But I would, you know, I man, I hardly ever had homework at home to do because I would, I would do my, my, my work on the bus. But it was still, it was a way for all of us to socialize and, you know, and the, like the high school bus, when I went to Tucson High, it only had, uh, it was a little short stubby bus, probably maybe six seats on each side. But there was only like maybe 12 of us going to high school. So. And we had a bus driver that uh, she, uh, she actually f taught men how to fly fighter planes during World War II. Her name was Gloria Boss, and she was, uh, she was a pretty neat bus driver. And she would, she would stop. She wasn't supposed to stop. But she would stop and, and let us you know, go buy candy or whatever you want or soda or whatever. And I remember the last day of school, and my first job was at Vail School. 
And one of the things that I did was I cleaned the buses. And I remember some of the kids got a little carried away and spilled some soda and stuff on the seats. And I was the last one on the bus. And she asked me, she said, uh, would you mind if we uh, pulled one into your house and, 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 wa and you can wash out the bus? Because, you know, she didn't, the, the man, Virgil Smith, is, that was the maintenance guy, he really liked her a lot. And he wouldn't have said anything. Because we never did anything to the bus, and nobody wrote on the walls or on the windows or cut the seats, and we we, we didn't do stuff like that. And so, and I told her, I said, "Well, I'm I'm going to be the one that's going to clean the bus." I said, and, and Virgil's not. If, if he saw it, he wouldn't say anything. She said, "Well, I just feel better." So she, I remember she pulled it in, and I had her park where, or so I could open up the back door and, and use the garden hose. There. My dad thought it was funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got a story for you, another story on the bus. I'm going to tell you, she was one of those bus drivers that, that she liked She liked us. And for some reason, they were working on Park Avenue, and, and that's how we would get to Tucson High. And we had to go a different way. We had to, I think we went up Palo Verde and then down 36th Street. Well, there were these kids, and I don't think they went to Tucson High. I think they went, probably went to Pueblo. But they, uh, they threw... Uh, they threw some, probably oranges, I don't know what they threw at us, but they threw something at the bus. So at Tucson High, outside the bookstore, they, there were two ornamental orange trees. <laughs> and most of us took our lunches. So we all saved the bag, you know, we fill up our lunch bag with, with, with oranges. <laughs> and we have them on the bus. And we're going, and, and we're going to go right back the same way, you know. And we all got out of school about the same time. And sure enough, we go down, we're going down 36th Street. And these kids, they must have been waiting for us, you know. And they're stopped. And even the girls, we had all the windows down on, on that side. And she, the bus driver made sure there were two lanes. She was in the right lane. And I remember. We're all ready, you know, to, to, for the, and I, and I looked at her, and she's looking over there, looking over there like that, and, and, and all of us, all the oranges we had, we threw at these kids, okay? and uh, the next day, they weren't walking down the street. Like fire with fire. Yeah. Anybody else? Go ahead, Jim. Where'd you get your mail at? Uh, the old post office. And Mary Jane Water was, was the postmaster. She was there forever. And uh, if you wanted to be able to get the mail when she, was, when she wasn't open, although she lived there, I mean, if you knocked on the door, she could give you her mail. But uh, they had uh, a platform all, all along the side of the uh, post office, on the west end of it. And you could buy a mailbox and, and put it there, and you put your name on the front of it, and, and she would put your mail on the mailbox. I don't think anybody ever had anything to take, and I don't ever remember hearing anything about that. Were the regular mailboxes? Or? Yeah, just a mail, regular mailbox. Go ahead. Um, what kind of car did you guys have? My dad was a real Ford guy, we always had a Ford pickup truck. How often did you guys use it? It's our car. Well, pretty <laughs> much just to go to town, unless, unless, uh, yeah. Like once a week? Uh, yeah, probably. I mean, my parents didn't go a lot, a lot of places. Kristen, how often do you use it? Uh, Every day. I, I didn't have my, well, I didn't have my driver's license then until you know I was I was a lot younger. But you know what I did have that radio station I told you about. I won a motorcycle. I say a motorcycle. It was a 50 cc Suzuki. When I was 13 years years old, I, I I won that, and I used to ride it around. And there were a lot of a lot of my friends had little had little little bikes, and the sheriff's department was very very lenient about they didn't they didn't bother you. Of course, we didn't get on the interstate or anything stupid like that. You know, with all the kids, we all had a lot more common sense, I think, than kids do today. Because the things the kids do today get in trouble, we wouldn't have even thought of doing it. Hmm. I'll tell you, I don't know how much you guys know about how the how the schools get their money for stuff, but the school board back then consisted of two ranchers and Mary Jane Warner. All right. Uh, Charlie Day and Henry Jackson were both millionaires back then. And if, if uh, Miss Esta, who was the principal, she decided, let's say that, that we used to have, we got new uh, baseball clubs every year. And, and at the end of the year, they would give, and we had games and stuff we would play, and they'd always give us stuff away to the, 
to the kids. So at the beginning of the year, you always needed new stuff. And and, and, and other things too, like uh, school supplies, pencils and paper and all that kind of stuff. Well, whatever the, whatever the Ms. Esther decided that she needed, she would make a list and she would give it to Mary Jane Warner, the postmaster. And then she would shop around and back then, I mean, that she did have, there was a phone, there was a party line and a phone with a crank. We had one. There was like eight, eight people on this line. But she would call and uh, and find out what, the, what where the best price was. And then she would call up, let's say she needed $500 to pay for her thing. So she would call up the two ranchers that were on the school board and they would both write her, they'd split the difference and write a check. And that's how we got, and, and we didn't want for anything. Anything we needed, we had. And there was no arguing or anything about it. We just, we just got what we, what we needed. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask the kids if they knew what a party line was. A, a party line phone, it's like everybody uh, can hear everybody else. Every, it's like having, every, having extensions in your house. And the way the phones would work, uh, uh, and you had to tell an operator everything, you know, you, it, there was no dial. Uh, you, it, they had different rings, like two longs and a short, or three longs or whatever, and, and that's how you knew you were getting the phone call. But you would hear the phone ring when other people got a phone call. And uh, I think that uh, nobody east of us was on, uh, we were the farthest east, but then uh, La Posta Camada had a phone, Rancho Lago had a phone, the post office had a phone. Dale School didn't have a phone, but the post office did. And, uh, and, the, and, and, and the X9, and I think may, uh, maybe the Rocking K, but I'm not, I'm not sure. But they could have been, they were close enough to Tucson, they may have been on another another party line. But that's who was on the one out, out here. And like the Andrada Ranch, uh, they were they had four four kids there and, and I liked I liked one of the the older daughter and she and I would just have, you know, like like at seven thirty at night we'd just pick up the phone and talk. Because if you picked the phone up, you could talk. And if somebody got a phone call while we were talking, the operator would come on and tell us to get off. <laughs> because she couldn't ring. If you had, if anybody had their phone off, she couldn't do the ring. So. Go ahead. What is your favorite memory about living in Vail? About living in Vail? Probably the school, going to school. Uh, it, was a, it was a lot bigger part of, of my life than, than anything else. It was just a, a, a good a good experience. Which dog was your favorite? Which job? Which dog? Oh, dog. Uh, you know, we used to get a lot of dogs because people would dump them. And, and we were, I mean, Avail was definitely rural back then. And for whatever reason, I probably people from Tucson, they want to get rid of their dog. They, and and they, they do it by my parents' place, you know. I saw, obviously, the dog would come up. I probably had... Ten different dogs, but uh, I think I, I had I, uh, this one dog. She was she was a mutt, but she was probably I think her father was an Australian Shepherd. I don't know I don't know about the about the mother. And, and, uh, I had her for a long time. When I got my well, she used to go with me everywhere I went, and I, and I used to go walk. I had a BB gun, you know. I I really wasn't into killing pack rats. That's what I used to shoot mostly. And you go out in the desert, and she would go with me. And then when I got that little motorcycle. You know she couldn't she couldn't go anymore and I, I one day i started it up and i was going to go out and just drive around and, and i could tell that she was no, not happy and i picked her up she was about a 30 pound dog and i put her i sat her on on the seat in front of me and she put her feet on the gas tank and then i used to drive around with her on my, on my little motorcycle and she never fell i mean i, I was I, you know, I was careful uh, but she never fell off and when i'd stop I'd, you know she'd jump off and go run around and, what was her name? Dynamite. <laughs> there was a some TV show that had a, there was a white horse on there called Dynamite, and I think that's why I named her. But, but she was a good dog. So living right on Highway 80, like that, I saw lots of people come and go, travelers shopping. What was the most unusual thing that? Well, somebody had a uh, 
I don't remember whether it was a lion or a tiger. I mean, a full-size one. And he, and he just left it there. And he had a trailer. It had a cage on it. It was like a car trailer. That's how big it was. And it had a big cage. And, and he, he couldn't get out. But I don't know what he told my parents. They need to go to Tucson or something. And he just left it and never came back. And I don't know what... What happened to it? Um, maybe they gave it to the, um, somebody came and got it, but it wasn't the guy that left it. That was, and then, and then one other time, the army, we didn't have diesel. We had, just had gasoline. And a, an army tank that had rubber treads ran out of fuel right there. And I, and I was like, you know, 10 years old. Can you imagine having an army tank sitting, sitting where you could go climb on it for a week? <laughs> that was, that was, that was pr pretty neat. And then we also had, uh, when I was older, the army at Fort Huachuca had a weather station that they, they put up by my, by my parents' house. And they, they, didn't, they didn't use radios for a lot of stuff back then. And they had these rolls of like graph paper that would record everything. And they used to come in a helicopter twice a week and take the paper and put new paper in. And, and they, obviously those guys would all come inside and eat. So I got to go and climb around in the helicopter too. Is there anything we didn't ask you that you would like to ask? Well, I could probably talk all day long. I mean, I just, it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I've got a little story for you that before, before I went to Yale school, uh, the first year we moved there, uh, one of the ranchers' uh, wives took my, my mother and me to a, to a Yale school Christmas program. And my mother didn't know what to expect at all. I mean, the woman just said, she had two kids that were already in school, and she said, you, you, you and your son like it. So, you know, it comes time for Santa Claus to start giving our presents to everybody, and, and uh, I remember my, my mother telling me this. She said, uh, she felt really bad. She said, well, everybody's gonna get a Christmas present except for Don. And, uh, but Santa Claus gave me two Christmas presents. He had two presents. And this rancher's wife, she, she knew, obviously, what the programs were like, and she went and got two presents and had them wrapped and put my name on there from Santa so that I got, I got two presents for Santa Claus. Well, that's yeah. cool. Uh, well, her name is jo as, uh, Dorothy Johnson. She's actually still alive. Is she, like, in her 90s now? 100? Uh, well, what were the presents? You know, I, I think one was a coloring book, and I don't know, maybe it was crayons and a coloring book. So, something along those lines. 